Recently, I received a comment that kind of made me thinking. This person is basically accusing me and a bunch of other creators for making low effort videos, I guess, instead of trying to come up with more innovative ideas like Eric Rosen. However, he ends on a good note saying that Levi Rosman bought all of his subscribers, which I honestly find pretty funny. Now, obviously, this is not the first. Neither the last time when I'm gonna receive such comments. In my defense, I want to let everybody know that all of these opponents that I'm playing against are not only gonna be getting their rating back because I'm playing from an authorized speedrun account, but they will additionally get my unconditioned love, which we both know it's priceless at this point. But after I recorded today's video, I really started to feel a little bit of pity and guilt, I guess, because I was not only doing the usual stuff, playing a rating climb, getting an account from 1100 all the way to 1200, but when checking out the games, I realized that most of them will have a quicker finish than usual, just because how tricky the following opening really is. Enjoy. Alright everybody, apparently we managed to get a white game, gonna be opening up with D4. We got an opponent here. Uh, Mr. Boris rated uh, 1250. I'm gonna be sticking with the Jabava London. And when they play Knight F6, this could be an indicator that they're trying to King's Indian or play the Nimzo. So I'm gonna do Knight C3, creating pretty much a huge positional threat of going for E4, which, hey, against the King's Indian, uh, it's really annoying for them to deal with. And the big problem for a lot of these uh, players that uh, go for the King's Indian is that uh, they are normally uh, not that comfortable playing the Pirk defense. Okay, they're mainly trying to reach these positions after C4. And then, um, you know, it's a bit of a different structure with the pawn on C4. Now with the Knight on C3, this pretty much uh, transposes to the Pirk. And, uh, well, even though... To the unexperienced eye, this just looks like it's the same, and that should be doing just fine. In fact, I get a lot of people asking me whether King's Indian is a good opening that they should incorporate uh, in their repertoire, just because it feels very easy to play at first glance, yeah? Like, Black just goes for this Fianchiero, castles, and uh, you get developed. Well, in my opinion, this is uh, by far the biggest opening that you should be staying away uh, from as a beginner. It is very tricky to play just because the pawn break varies a lot. Uh, yeah, you need to play either e5 or c5, sometimes c6, it depends. You pretty much need to be like a chameleon, which, uh, yeah, as a beginner at first, uh, let's say that uh, you're playing more of like an elephant. You're not that flexible. Anyways, in case you're here for the Jubava London, that's not really helpful for you, but... Uh, I'm glad we clarified that. I'm, I'm gonna be going for bishop to f4, which is really my main exploit in this variation, okay? Like, if you're thinking about this, it's just like a money generator three, okay? I call this an exploit because technically it is not the uh, most precise line of all time, but it's just gonna give you three wins, okay? If you think about this, you can compare it with like poker, in poker, if you feel like your opponent plays very passive, you can just open whatever cards you have for like a min raise. And just because he's falling too much, you're making money, you're just generating profit. So the same with e5 here. If you're doing this, you can either get a, a very fast checkmate or you're gonna get a good attack because you already played the e5, which is not the best move. Very rarely, okay, occasionally, they may go knight h5, but I recommend you go bishop back, uh, sacrificing this pawn, go queen e2, castle. We already have this, uh, have had this in the rating climb. Um, and after the e5, we're just going to be taking. And normally, they're going to be trading queens. Like, uh, 8 out of 10 of your opponents are going to enter this line. And, uh, yeah, the commentary may take longer than the game. Because <laughs> usually, this just ends very quickly. And he goes knight to d7, attacking the pawn on e5. Now, this is the key moment to remember. White has a critical move. Because the first instinct for a lot of people would just be to defend their pawn on e5 because it is kind of unprotected. However, when you become a little bit of a stronger player, you start looking more for uh, intermediate moves and creating stronger threats. And to give you a hint, I'm gonna let you know that c7 is the weakest square. 
So we have either knight b5 or knight to d5. Which one do you think is better? I'm telling you that. Well, if you think that the answer is knight b5, well, let me uh, reward you the wooden spoon because you're close, but that is not the move. You had a 50% chance to guess it, so congrats on missing that. It's better to play knight to d5 because if you're going knight to b5, that allows him knight a6. But knight a6 here is not really saving because the bishop is still open. So with your knight on b5, that would be blocking bishop's diagonal. I hope that's clear for everybody that's watching. Um, and after knight e5, he's simply not having a way to defend the c7 square. Like only move his king to d8. And you can go ahead, pause the video yet again. Because white just has a beautiful way to break through. I even had this position against the grandmaster once in blitz. So uh, yeah. If you think uh, we should sack, well, you need to uh, control your ADHD brain a little bit because you would take an E695, but you can simply push, opening up the line, and uh, then after FE, knight C7, pretty much trapping the rook, okay? Very simple stuff, okay? This is genuinely a blueprint on how to defeat uh, any King's Indian type of player. And I'm super glad that he plays E5. E5 is by far the most uh, challenging response, where it's genuinely very tempting to go ahead and uh, take the rook, thinking that, oh, we are just going to be cashing in a lot of material. But if you look a little bit deeper, after pawn takes, our knight is a bit trapped, and black can slowly pick it up. So in fact, it's precise to turn, go knight e6, for king, uh, king and bishop, because his only move is king e8. And then you can take this bishop with check. And then also save your own bishop. So you're technically going to be uh, up a piece. This is actually, we're still following uh, my game against the Grandmaster here. Uh, maybe I'll even show it to you after the game. So we take, now he's saying, okay, this is the first aha moment for my uh, opponent. He thinks he tricked us, attacking these two pieces. But it's like a surprisingly funny construction where you just play bishop to h6 and all of your pieces are defended. He just has... No way to counter that. Uh, you're just having an extra piece despite uh, this kind of like weird placement. And now it is your turn to seal the deal. Okay, this is the cherry on top of the cake. White to play, forcing black to resign and probably quit chess, honestly. Because after bishop to c4, this is just ending the game. Are you guys even paying attention to what's happening right now? This is a live game. This is not a recording. But like everything feels to be mixing quite perfectly. Which, yeah, just speaks for the strength of the variation. Play e5. They enter this endgame. They are absolutely doomed. Uh, okay. Whether yeah, any square king goes to pick up the rook. You're going to be having uh, both a rook and an extra minor piece. So I'd say not too shabby on move 14. Okay, opponent spending a little bit of time. He perhaps realized that his position may not be okay. Uh, either this or he's looking for the uninstall button on chess.com. Do you guys ever have a losing session and uh, uninstall your app? Uh, man, I used to uninstall chess.com on a regular basis. Just have one of those losing sessions. <laughs> I don't want to see chess again. Uh, but okay, opponent keeps playing. And still, we got a bunch of material, but we got a very funny coordination where my pieces are kind of trapped into his own garden. Doing a little bit of gardening, you know, just chilling over there. Uh, however, what if I'm going to say, we play 98? And we're going to say hello to this rook yet again. Remember where it all started? Like we were attacking this rook. And now we can come and say hello to it again. But wait a second, because I think there's something even better. This is absolutely crazy. Oh my goodness. We may even have a better move than going for the rook. You pause the video and try to find it, okay? I know I'm asking for like the million time. But... This is really going to help your chess, finding these good moves. Okay, simple move, like knight c7, sure. Collect everything, all his pieces, dignity included. But, I think even better. You play for the chainmate, sealing the mating net, sealing the coffin. He takes the knight, but then there is comes 
the rook. Getting a checkmate. Okay. Moment of silence for my opponent. I think this was a perfect game. Let's check the game review. You got a 94? Uh, well, probably. <laughs> According to chess.com, we played like in 1950. <laughs> Not too shabby. But uh, yeah, the main thing that you really want to remember, okay? Uh, you may be getting this position like regularly. First of all, what you guys need to understand is that uh, the most important thing, if you're trying to get the same position, you want to remember the timing, okay? Like normally the way I teach openings and uh, chess in general is setup based. Like if the move further, you may mess things up and still get the same plans, get a good position. However, when you are playing this stuff, you really need to get the timing right, okay? You want to be playing e5 in this very position, in this exact moment, uh, not a move earlier, not later. Here, very important. You want to be taking back with the rook on d1 and then... Uh, where a lot of people may be uh, shooting themselves in the foot is they think, okay, I need to go for the fork. I remember this. And they play knight b5. Thinking, okay, how is he going to defend? Well, the problem is that now black simply has the move knight a6. And let me tell you the news. Black is better. Simply because your bishop doesn't jump over the knight. <laughs> so, after knight d5, knight a6, not a, not a thing. Bishop can eliminate. White is completely winning. So, uh, yeah, remember this. Uh, in case he would have gone for uh, knight fd7, which they do occasionally, important that you do everything uh, that you can with the price of your life to defend the e5 pawn. Because a lot of people here just forget about the pawn, but you can play queen e2. No need to be worried about uh, locking the bishop because we can castle, the queen then will slide up, prepare this idea, bishop will be open, push h4, h5, get an attack, and white just has a crashing position. So, um, really, I think that's kind of all you need to know for now. And uh, with that being said, we can move on to the following game. All right, boys and girls, managed to find uh, another white game. Let's open up with d4, and hopefully my opponent is going to be playing... Uh, Something normal. We see the knight. Gonna be starting with the knight, of course, in the Jabava. Always start with the knight. And okay, is this the King's Indian day? Because d6 is already like a very good indicator that he may fear and care of, Just because the bishop is gonna be like restricted by its own pawn and maybe doing this. We're gonna go e4, okay? Like a, a big thing about the Jabava London is that uh, you are playing d4, knight c3, just creating a big positional threat of e4. More or less forcing the majority of your opponents to play d5, and we enter those typical positions. So, we have the d6 kind of guy here, though. I'm gonna play e4, and probably, yeah, we do see Fianchiero, and we are gonna be sticking with the little exploit. Hello, opponent. Does he wanna have the same fate as the previous guy? I guess we're about to find out. So he takes, like most of them are doing. Remember knight h5, bishop d2. Um, but uh, yeah, expecting queen trade. Hopefully he plays something different just to show uh, more like variety of gameplay. But I guess crushing him in 10 moves won't be too bad for the video either. So no matter where they go with the knight, same idea. Place your knight onto d5. Hopefully you remember that one. Don't go knight b5 because of knight d6. And he... Literally has no way to defend c7. He's lost. Move 8. Completely busted. Okay, I'm like not even kidding. Not even exaggerating rather. 95. How's the video? You already know what's coming probably. 97 end. You may be thinking, Oh, we are just about to collect this rook. Yeah, that's a free rook. Yeah, that's a free rook. That's a free rook. You can take it. Yes. Go ahead. Take your rook. Take the rook in your own games. Yeah. We'd better not talk about that one. So, why is just getting the checkmate? Very simple, yeah? Ten moves. That's how most of your games are gonna go. <laughs> Pretty absurd, I know. But, I promise, I already coached a lot of people to play this. It just works out the same until, like, 
1800 in rapid even there it happens regularly so that being said i think we can really move on to the following game all right boys and girls getting another white game let's open up with d4 and okay finally getting a game where uh, my opponent plays d5 meaning that uh we are gonna be getting a more like a standard setup so i'm gonna go knight to c3 bishop to f4 i'm saying more of like a standard setup i'm guessing and okay this is what I would be expecting you to get uh, most of the times. Unless your opponent <laughs> starts to be very cheeky with bishop to g4. Now, bishop to g4 is of course a very stupid move in itself. But uh, yeah, it is stupid because it's not developing the bishop with any purpose. It is vulnerable to my pawn pushes. Uh, Generally, you're supposed to move a knight before bishop in the opening. And uh, I think really the only justification behind his last move is that if I play e3, he takes my queen. Right. But here, you know, if he was to play bishop f5, our fundamental rule that we like to use and an analogy about this is that we can use the bamboo stick. Okay, we can play f3. There's this like kind of funny saying that the bamboo stick grows under the earth for like a year and then in like three weeks it grows into the sky for like 10 meters. Something insane that you don't expect to happen. Same way we're gonna get uh, like a bamboo forest of pawns here. F3, G4, push them all. Here just because he played it in a very sort of weird way. I can start with h4. That's kind of like guaranteed to win you a piece in lower rate games. Uh, just because he doesn't uh, see in advance. I'm threatening that. I don't want the free piece, okay? I want to show you how to win these positions in um, like by the book using middle game plans. He goes h6, okay? In case of h5, I would have pushed. Typical mistake that they make. Uh, 97 uh, dropping pawn. Uh, okay, h6 now, uh, in case you're confused about when to push h5 and when not to, I would, adv I would advise you not to play it. Not a mistake by any means if you're playing it, but I'm more of a fan of sticking with simple play, preparing bishop trade and then knight e2, always take with a queen on d3. And the idea why I like to keep these pawns together is pretty much because uh, in the long run, once we castle long and the rook on h1 more specifically is protected. We're going to be using the g5 push and then take back with a pawn. Which would not be a possibility if you just play this kind of reflex move going h5. Thinking, okay, I grab a little bit of space, which is true. But if I ask you what you're going to do with that space, I guess you don't really know. <laughs> because it's not very clear. So bishop d6, important rule for the f3 g4 uh, Structure here, we always want to take back on f4 with the knight. So you have two moves, knight e2 and knight h3. Usually if knight e2 was blocking the bishop, we would go to the side. But now because we already developed the bishop, we prefer to have the knight closer to the center of the board. So knight e2, um, and common mistake is for them to take and activate your pieces for absolutely no reason. But in beginner's brain, uh, they just think, uh, okay, they need to... Uh, take and I forgot to mention dude this guy what is he doing like I could have also taken on g6 uh, I just kind of assume that bishop takes on d3 is gonna be automatically happening we take with the queen but when he played bishop to d6 I just kind of uh yeah went on autopilot mode explaining the rule so I guess you can throw in that move but definitely on a6 we're gonna be playing this you cannot allow this simply okay Allowing bishop takes uh, on g6 is pretty much setting your position in ruins for the rest of the game. Uh, because it's pretty much like uh, removing the bottom piece of the whole Jenga tower of my opponent's position. Now this pawn is weak, this pawn is weak. I go for the same, queen d3. It's just that now his fundament has been completely messed up. He just has so many weaknesses all of a sudden and he has less space. So, queen e3, more or less, he's forced to play king f7, the only move to genuinely not lose the pawn. We're gonna cast along. And it's important, okay, once they're playing something like king to f7, is that, um, yeah, 
you, you really slow down, okay? When he plays king f7, you need to put your hands under your butt. Okay, and I'm going to explain why. This is a saying, by the way, that uh, one of my old coaches used to have. He, he usually had this uh, saying, whenever you have a good position, put your hands under your butt. Important. Under, not inside. Because that is going to control your reflex for ruining your position. So you tend to think more and, you know, when you have pleasant position, it's easy. Oh, let's just make moves. I got so many opportunities and you just mess things up. So, uh, bishop f4, clear blunder. I can go intermediate move. I can also go knight f4 because he's lacking any defense. I think both are equally good. I'm going to go intermediate just to highlight the power of uh, intermediate moves and taking with a knight. So, really, I had to make no moves by myself in this game. This is just how effective uh, the strategy is. You just have simple development, and if they allow that weak pawn on g6, chances are uh, you may very well just win it. Uh, I'm pretty much ready to cast a long next and play g5. Um, I could think of queen f7 now. The main thing that you need to understand is that we want a pawn. And when I'm winning the pawn, this just gives me kind of like the mental stability that, okay, all the trades are going to favor us, queen trade included. Usually when you are up a pawn, you should simply switch to the uh, simple mood of exchange all the pieces, getting into a king and pawn endgame, and that's just automatic win. Here, because his king is weak, that changes nothing, okay? That's just kind of like a nice perk. Would be nice to mate him, but you shouldn't uh, make this goal of checkmating uh, the most important thing of the game just because you feel like uh, he's very weak. No, it's just because he does uh, have a weak king doesn't mean you need to invest all of your resources trying to mate it. Okay? No, that's just going to make it harder for him to like coordinate his pieces. We pretty much keep the same strategy of uh, going for endgame because it's the simplest and the most efficient. You're gonna go g5. And yeah, with the risk of uh, repeating myself like a broken record, if we get the mate, that's nice. But that's not, uh, you know, not the main thing here. We just wanna make small improvements. Remember the g5 break that I told you to do? Important to have rooks defended because <laughs> that, make big, that might uh, backfire elsewhere. And now he has to take. If you go here, that allows rook d1 check and you lose. So have to recapture, the knight has to go now even more passive, and we have a very easy move, the position just plays itself, we have a rook to h7 next to infiltrate, okay, rooks are usually the most active pieces when they occupy the 7th rank, here uh, we have a very uh, juicy target, the g7 pawn, and yeah, about to collect that, I don't really see how my opponent's willing to make hard play, perhaps should try knight e8 to have some extra protection over g7 but then one maneuver that can be pretty nice in the job of London is that this knight can go to d3 not only controlling e5 but also creating ideas of knight c5 um, still because this is such a tempting position i want to uh, have a quick glance over moves like knight d5 which perhaps seems to win by force here because after queen f5 king d8 knight e6 it feels like uh, we're putting his king in a very vulnerable position. Like, has to go king c8. Do I have a mate after? Knight c5, king b8 only move, and he seems to be running away. So before I do the tactic, I can improve my position, and he is literally, like, backed. Like, he has no moves. We can send him to the post office. Or, actually, postal office. Whatever the word is. <laughs> And now we do the little combo, because after knight e5, well, he has to take it, because else he just lost a pawn and he's in total collapse. But then we have the nice little uh, retreating move with queen f5. And not only that, uh, well, uh, we would have had an improved version, but his king can no longer go to d8, because the rook is uh, in the way. And king d6, uh, I let you find the mate in one. Because white uh, just collects the win. Queen e6, obviously we take. King e6, you pick up that pawn. So, eventually we do uh, win the game uh, by delivering uh, 
Hakimate, but remember, that's an additional thing, okay? We had our main goal, the goal that uh, you start the game with, okay? I want to win one pawn, <laughs> trade all the pieces, keep that and fine. If your opponent allows any sacrifices, or if you feel like uh, you can mathematically sacrifice something and win, go for it, checkmate. Brag about it to your friends. So, yeah, in case this was not uh, happening, I want to make it very clear that if you're a beginner, uh, yeah, half of your games, uh, you're going to do way better without sacrificing. So, sacrificing should be very sensible. You only sacrifice when you're like 100% sure it works. Because it's very common in this rating range, people over-sacrifice. They sacrifice because they don't know what they're doing. And I can tell you actually like a very personal story about how these things go and why perhaps it's even better to avoid it. So, okay. Not sure if I really want to share this, but if I talk a little bit about my dating life. Okay. I used to have the most success whenever I talk the least. So just stay there and try to smile. Okay. I recommend you do something similar in chess. Okay, like the <laughs> more you're not talking, the higher the chances that you're not going to say something stupid. So, the less you sacrifice, the less blunders you're going to be making. So, just stay there, smile, and wait for your opponent to blunder. And that is going to be already uh, impacting your win rate uh, tremendously in like a positive way. So, uh, yeah. Decisive mistake about this game, uh, not taking on d3, he should have done that, uh, would have played knight e2, long castle, and then g5 break. We had a bunch of games uh, like this in the rating climb already, so make sure to check out those if you haven't, and I think we can just move on to the following game. Alright everybody, getting another game with the white pieces. Are we gonna be getting another king's in? And hopefully not. Hopefully you get to show a little bit of variety. Uh, and here we have e6. Now I can go ahead and uh, do the Hans Niemann speech explaining how uh, they may play the French, but uh, we don't know if they are comfortable in the French. Uh, therefore, giving us a psychological advantage because they are not playing the French. I'll link you a clip with that in the description. It is pretty really ridiculous. I know it may sound like total nonsense what I'm saying right now. But I'm going to pin the comment so you know the clip that I'm talking uh, about. Uh, okay. C5. Interesting stuff. He is threatening to take the pawn on D4. Now, usually D5 is best move here. I can tell you this, uh, that pushing and just this concept of grabbing more space against the Benoni, uh, it is usually the way to go. However, uh, it could also be interesting to go DC, trying to keep a more compact set of positions, hopefully transposing to this kind of structure. Okay, black plays like uh, castle, we castle, they go 96 and break with E4. That is one thing, but I'm going to go ahead and show you the idea behind uh, grabbing space. And after ED, we take with the knight and we just get a very annoying knight uh, onto the D5 square super juicy outpost he just has no way to get rid of the knight because um, there is obviously no point that he can use it to attack and okay knight f6 makes me think that we may get to see a very typical blunder that even uh, title players make because after e4 it is very tempting to take which is losing on the spot he's supposed to push uh, queen spawn here one square but a lot of them are taking which is ridiculous Another typical mistake, bishop e7, allowing d6. That's pretty crashing as well. But I'm really hoping uh, that we get to show the refutation, okay? All right. Is this the episode of the typical blunders? Because now after e5, okay, very important. Most people expect you to take, but you can just advance uh, and kick their knight. And okay, he plays knight to e4. I know this is losing for a fact, but I need to remember why. <laughs> this why is always uh, the problem. 
I just feel like, uh, you know, I analyze this uh, sometimes, but it's very blurry in my memory. It's just like uh, you get very drunk at a party and you remember that you may have gone to some place, but you don't remember what happened there. So that's kind of me trying to recall my files. I do believe it should be knight x on d5, just because this knight uh, is kind of vulnerable to f3. Queen d5 is also very reasonable, because after takes, pawn takes, I assume he plays bishop e7. Mm, how do we win there? It's not very obvious how to win in that position, so that makes me perhaps uh, second guess that idea. Yeah, I think it's probably knight d5. Bishop e7, queen g4 should be the killer move. Targeting knight and targeting g7 pawn. And yeah, any queen h4 shenanigans, simply... Can we go g3? Allowing knight g3, pawn takes, queen e4 check. I feel like this should be still winning for us, even though it looks cheeky. Uh, but yeah, probably he goes bishop e7, blundering uh, queen g4. In case of knight to c6, we may still have the same idea. Because the knight is kind of trapped. Like, genuinely trapped. Maybe d6 is more interesting, stopping queen g4. But d6, I have queen e2. And when the knight moves, I have e d6 at least. Discovery uh, on the e file and preparing knight c7. But he plays c4. Out of all these moves, we are not able to guess it. But his idea is pretty sensible. Like, he's saying, okay, I'm sacrificing pawn because I have square for the knight. Trying to go for the uh, lesser evil, perhaps. Now I notice uh, there's maybe queen e2 or queen d4. Targeting the knight. We can also simply take, you know. <laughs> I think I start queen f3. Just because I want to get rid of the knight as soon as we can. And I'm predicting knight to c5. Uh, okay, he goes queen to a5 check. Which is actually uh, something that I forgot about. Yeah, for this reason, I guess I should have sticked to the natural queen d4. But, okay, can you just retreat? Not a, not a big problem. However, that uh, gives him knight c3. So, here, if you take with a queen, you just lost. After bishop to b4. And, uh, if you take with a pawn, he gets queen e5. And he gets way more compensation than uh, he was supposed to. But, okay, we're gonna play the game, uh, like, anyways, you know? I can blunder, even, sometimes. Not a problem, okay? I think it's also important to know how to deal with this kind of blunder. So I'm gonna do knight e2, just because, uh, well, if I block with a bishop, then it's not clear what to do with a knight. So I'm blocking with a knight, and then maybe I can fianchero. I'm gonna start by trying to get a uh, fast development. Bishop to f4, and then maybe rook d1, if he unpins like moving the queen to other files so I can move. I would move the knight and then develop bishop. Uh, castling long would be running into bishop a3, queen b6, so that would be too much to blunder. Uh, I could do g3, h4, bishop h3 type of ideas. I could do rook d1, which, yeah, it's a bit of a funny, weird position where we don't have development, but on the other hand, how is he defending the d5 pawn? Spoiler alert, I think he's not. But... Once we win that pawn, still, it does not look completely obvious. Just uh, because, uh, well, we have symmetric uh, structure. But after queen d5, I think it's very important to understand the idea that the pawn on c4 is overextended. Meaning that it is a very costly pawn for black to keep. You know, you just have like a very expensive car, but then you're not thinking about all the additional things that you need to pay for. Like, all the girls that you're gonna get because you own the car. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna be very hard for him to keep that pawn on c4. Because if he pushes any of these pawns, they are gonna be very vulnerable. And in fact, he's even spending quite, actually, I would rather say burning a lot of time trying to solve this problem. But, um, I think for him, he should Definitely stick with uh, some simple play like bishop e7 castle. However, on bishop to e7, I spotted another interesting idea besides rook takes, which was fine. But on bishop e7, maybe queen g3 could be interesting. Not only targeting the knight, which a lot of people may forget about, but 
also hinting towards the g7 pawn. So I'm going to f5. That's saying, okay, I want to trade pawns. My opponent is genuinely inviting me to go rook takes on d5 because he thinks taking on c2 is important. But this is a very important uh, fundamental idea that he is going with his queen, you know, in the woods. The queen goes hunting. Dude, that's no. The queen is not supposed to go hunting. So that is going to get me trouble most likely. Look at our position. We got three, four pieces. He only has queen. Move 13. He only has Kavin developed. So, okay. First of all, look for potential threats. Queen b1 only check. We have rook d1. We don't care. Now, second of all, we need to look for ways to try to mate him. Do we have any, like, immediate combination to mate him? Not that I see, at least. And therefore, we need to develop. I would love to play knight d4, but knight d4 is blocking uh, the rook. So after the check, uh, we don't have a simple move. Actually, not uh, such an easy position as uh, I initially thought. Um, okay, we need to make some moves. This would be threatening mate. So let's play it. Threatening mate in one. <laughs> Always a good idea. He can play knight c6, but I think we have maybe the craziest tactic of all time. Oh my god. I really hope he plays knight c6. That's gonna allow such a gorgeous sequence. You have no idea what's coming. Okay, this is actually quite beautiful if he plays knight c6. So it's, it's very logical, yeah? Like, how else to defend? It's not like you're gonna play f6 weakening. Right? Like, f6 just allows a lot of other things, like maybe check. Um, so he has to probably play knight c6. You're not gonna play bishop e7 because that, uh, you know, you're losing the right to castle. You're not gonna block with a bishop because it's weird. Ah, and he just goes for check, really? Rook d1? He just allows checkmate. Dude, now you have to give up your queen. He literally lost the queen and his mind with that move. Huh. Well, I guess it's not gonna be as instructive as I was hoping it to be. But I'm going to show you what I mean. Because on knight c6, we would have had a very similar idea. But with the knight on c6, that would have stopped checkmate. But I had queen c6 planned. And then to get this nice little uh, mating pattern. But uh, hey, this just gets to show you why you should never break this rule of uh, developing your queen early into the game. Okay, it's such a valuable piece that uh, you cannot really risk it, okay? One way you can think about this, and I actually like to use this analogy, is that uh, when I was a kid, and that's perhaps the case with a lot of Romanian kids, your parents used to uh, send like a, <laughs> a three-year-old to the local grocery shop to buy cigarettes, or sometimes even alcohol. And they would like hand them money and send them to the shop. <laughs> Dude, you cannot send the kid like that. I mean, what if... Somebody is going to steal the kid and you lose the money. So, you can make another kid. <laughs> um, he just resigns. Fine. So, he does all of these and look. If he was... I think bishop g5 was a good move, by the way. Yeah, bishop g5, top line. I simply couldn't find other way to create play. Because it's a very weird position where we need to make use of what we are having, okay? I think this is also another instructive idea. Because... A lot of the times, uh, well, the way I teach chess, it pretty much becomes mathematical. It becomes a blueprint. But sometimes, you know, you'll be having situations like this when you're unprepared and uh, you need to uh, start using your perspicacity. All right. And oftentimes, the key idea is to try to focus on your stronger side. Because if you think, oh, I got these pieces, I cannot develop, start crying, let me fianchero, get castle, and all that, you're going to be losing the momentum. No. Sure. It's like in life. You cannot have everything perfect, but you need to celebrate your wins. I think way too many people uh, don't celebrate their wins enough. So our positive side is that all these pieces are developed. 
let's try to make some use of them, okay? Try to focus always on the positive side of it. I go bishop g5, uh, of course, helps the guy uh, when the guy uh, blunders queen. But very important, on knight c6, I would have gone rook d2. Predict 100% he would have checked, and then he would have get, captured pawn. Yeah, it's better for him to go back, but he would have captured pawn. And here you have this stunning idea that uh, I was cooking this whole time. You can go, queen takes on c6. Simple tactic, eliminating the defender of the d8 square, because that's the big idea, but the knight covers. And then you just have rook d8, and this is a very nice little mating net that uh, you're going to be getting used to by solving a lot of puzzles. So, uh, if you really care about your chess improvement, you should be uh, you should be spending your time 50-50 uh, um, between uh, doing puzzles uh, and playing. And I guess watching this video is also, it's not gonna hurt. But if you have to, uh, yeah, really do something, you really have to do the puzzle. So we both know that you're not gonna do that. So let's just move on to the following game. All right, everybody, we're one game away from reaching 1,200. Hopefully, we're going to be getting a Jabava London here, and we're going to be getting this uh, nice little uh, benchmark, you know, 1,200. Not too bad. Bishop to 4 facing a 50, I mean, 1150 opponent. Let's see what he has in mind, and we see e6, okay? I'm super glad we get to face e6, because this is one of the most common moves by far, and it's going to be leading to a very important pawn structure that uh, you need to understand and from my experience a lot of people uh, underestimate the strength of this move forcing black to make concession usually bishop d6 beginner games knight e6 also kind of equally popular uh, but it's clearly not a move that you make with a happy face so bishop to d6 okay it's important that already uh, you are Remembering the main idea, and the main idea is to win the bishop pair. You win the bishop pair by uh, taking it with a knight. Trading with bishop really cancels all your previous play. Uh, so yeah, winning the bishop pair, and when you win the bishop pair, it's already important to understand the kind of game that we are going to be getting. Because in the Jobava, okay, if you've been watching and tolerating me this whole video, you notice that a lot of the times you have crazy attacking positions that just go very nice. But here, you win the bishop pair, you have to really understand that this means the game is going to slow down. Winning bishop pair, then just play it slow, play positional. Positional usually means you castle short and you go for a pawn break um, and wait. So, usually, um, in general, in Jobava, we play e3 before knight f3. So, e3 and then knight f3. And really, the biggest question uh, in this pawn structure, okay, very important that you have this pawn structure in your mind, because some uh, specific rules will apply. Uh, it's all about where do you develop the light square bishop. So, okay, <laughs> less experienced players would go bishop to b5, but then he has queen a5. Uh, hello? That just wins a piece. And from my experience, most people would just play bishop d3. And soon after rook e8, castle, e5, it's already too late, you know. Uh, <laughs> you realize like uh, four years into the medical school that uh, this is not for you. <laughs> because whenever, whenever you move the bishop, then you get forked and you lose a piece. So bishop d3, active square, but because of these pawns, you want to stay away from that because this is too big of a threat. And you just play positional bishop to e2, okay? Passive looking, but hey, these are two bishops. Don't uh, underestimate uh, these bad boys. Okay, we're gonna castle, and once you castle, very next move, you're pretty much ready to play c4. If he plays b5, yeah, not allowing c4, you just need to look for another pawn break. So, in case you're missing the pawn break, useful moves are h3, bishop, h2. Just having a nicely safer bishop, but uh, okay, when he plays bishop b5, uh, I mean pawn to b5. That is just creating a hook. So I want you to like really get used to this concept of what is a hook? You say hook all the time is the same thing as hookers. No, it's not. He plays b5. This is a hook because we can try to make use of it. We're going to hook it in a way. Usually with pawns. So imagine if I used to play a4 here. Uh, that's not going to take me very far. 
and perhaps a6 could be a hook in this position like if you go c3 b4 and then b5 you're gonna target the pawn open up the position here b5 instantly a4 putting pressure we use the hook we open things up what this is gonna result in is most likely he takes and then he has weak pawn on a6 isolated pawn that's just a target if he plays b4 we're gonna go a5 isolating this pawn and uh yeah was i gonna go a5 allowing knight takes debatable uh before anyways we can play c3 and make some use of the queen side pawns but on bishop to d7 that is not only uh completely ignoring the pawn on b5 but it's also uh kind of like a blind spot that i've noticed the uh, lower rated players have here as black and white players miss it usually too when something like this happens uh, this interrupts the queen so because the pawn on d6 is kind of like defended for a lot of moves people usually just stop looking into that direction but no you need to constantly be worried and aware that this is a thing that's a hanging pawn that you can take uh, and okay just gonna collect the other pawn too i'm just gonna try to stick with clinical play from now on collecting the three pawns and try to exchange everything because yeah this is just a positional thing and you can pretty much notice that we very much just won this game because we uh, knew the concept of the hook. So you know concept of the hook? Play a4. Take advantage of his uh, early kind of premature awakening. And knight b4 is thinking, okay. He just played knight b4 thinking that, oh, I'm opening up some tactics. If he takes... Uh, no, he, he was thinking, if I take his knight, that's free. He takes my bishop. But no, I can kind of reverse the order. Yeah, like I can think about it the other way. I go bishop d7. And then I take this knight. And you just take the L. There's nothing to be taken. You are down a piece. So, hey, just is easy when uh, you just stick to the rules. c3, defend the bishop. Trade back. Ready to activate my knight. Um, when he plays knight e4, I would be considering knight to d2, but that would be, I think, a common mistake. Because knight e2 is the concept of getting rid of his annoying piece, but it doesn't work tactically because he can take my rook. And my queen noticed that it's overloaded having to recapture and defend the knight. Then this guy remains undefended. So we need to come up with a better move. And I mentioned already that we're going to be trying uh, to trade as many pieces as we can. I think a nice move to begin with is knight e5, simply activating my knight even further. And then perhaps repairing queen d3, offering the queen trade. So... Yeah, he plays f6. Now I can either retreat, but then the same problem. Knight is, uh, I mean, queen is uh, overloaded. Allows rook a1, and then my knight hangs here again. And if you don't see a better move, you can retreat. Accept your mistake. But we can go intermediate move, queen d3. He's attacking my knight. You're not forced to retreat your knight. You can look for a stronger threat. So stronger threat is targeting his queen. And uh, in the same time, uh, once he moves it... I manage to activate this piece, and then I can retreat after. If he takes, obviously we manage to save the knight in the process. So, knight is attacked, move it back, and then, because my queen is no longer overloaded, like the rooks are now defending each other, I can stick with simple move, trying to get rid of this annoying piece. And slowly but surely, notice that we are making uh, baby steps to giant improvement. He had a very active position. But the only thing that you need to do in order to just get a massive win rate whenever you have extra material, you just like tend to constantly blackmail your opponent with these uh, little trades. Because whenever he trades, that's pretty much, you know, uh, accelerating his death with like uh, 10 years. So, um, yeah, you have an extra pawn, offer him trades and whatever trade he needs to avoid, he will just be conceding squares and space on the board, which is just going to give you even more juicy opportunities. Like, for instance, look, I got this very active knight, and because of it, now I can infiltrate with a move like rook a6. Threatening to double up, trade even more pieces. And if he exchanges, that's putting me in a very advantageous position of taking with the queen, pretty much forcing queen trade because I'm targeting... Uh, uh, both his queen and also the e6 pawn. So really, um, by getting better at this concept of, okay, let's blackmail him with trades, and when he declines uh, to 
slowly infiltrate into his position. Um, that just can put you ahead uh, hundreds of points alone. Just this skill, okay? Um, and it is really not something that you can train in other way. Like doing puzzles, that's not going to improve this ability. But simply looking for it. So, yeah, you just need to get into the habit of, okay, how do I make, uh, how do I make small improvements? How do I offer clever trades? Because I know there's going to be people in the comments of this video saying that, Oh, I try to do this, I exchange all the pieces and then I lose. Well, that's because you're applying the concept in a blind way. Look, trade both rooks, avoid uh, check, offer queen trade. So, whenever you're looking for a trade, most of the times uh, it's best to try and exchange uh, pieces of similar activity. I think that's the most important twist that you can add to this rule because obviously if you are trading your most active pieces for his worst placed pieces constantly, that is going to give uh, him some activity and may get you in trouble. Okay, what am I going to do now? I'm going to look for ways to trade. What can I trade? Well, I don't see a direct way to trade queen, but I see a way to trade his knight. So I do bishop a5 no matter that I'm losing the pawn because I can take his knight and then retreat. So, okay, we trade, take his knight, and he takes with the queen. Now I can take free pawn. Yes, that's pretty simple. It's there. Has only move, and then I can win the queen. But if you don't see the move that wins the queen, you can still offer queen trade, and then you have knight idea. Yeah, just to show you this, I think it's perfect illustration of the concept. Okay, let's blackmail him. Like, if he trades queens, he knows he's lost. He needs to try queen there, at least hoping for, like, a back ranker. But then because he's, like, conceding so many squares on the board, you pretty much get to shoulder him all the way into the corner. Like, see, he's trying this. Okay, good credits. I mean, I give him my opponent. Really, I take my hat uh, off for him because if white player is not careful and randomly starts pushing, then you have mate in one. So you're giving yourself some chances, at least, despite being lost. But now, you see, because... He had to like concede so many squares, we just easily infiltrate uh, into his position, deliver mate. And obviously, if he was to trade the uh, queens there, uh, I mean, I have easiest win of all time. I mean, I can give up the knight and have four connected pawns. The last idea is to, let's say, take and then bring the king. Yeah, and you never need to be afraid of something like king b3 that's taking your pawns because your king needs to always uh, watch out for this pawn not to promote. And if he stays, uh, like, in the middle, you just bring your own king and then uh, slowly start pushing these pawns. Yeah, push them. You can even sacrifice pawns like this because of the same concept that you queen. So very easy stuff. Just need to um, start crafting a little bit your technique of offering the trades. And you can easily even reach a rating life. 1,200 in blitz or even more. So with that being said, I think we can really move on to the following game. Thanks a lot for making it this far into the video. I mean, you've been tolerating me for more than 53 minutes already. That's probably 50 minutes extra than my mom can do. That is very much appreciated. And before I let you go, I wanted to let you know that I am currently working on making a course with this opening. This is how much I actually love it and I got to hire Badur Jobava to work together. I mean, he's genuinely the inventor of this. He has its own name. But until that is ready, please feel free to check out the playlist that we already have on the channel related to the Jobava London. Enjoy!